Hello the world, uh, hello internet, uh, is that, yes, yes, hi, Jason Isaacs at the back there, fantastic. Uh, right, today we are talking direct democracy. Uh, and uh, let's just start off by reaffirming what we know, that a democracy is a system of government predicated on popular sovereignty. And uh, here's a little thing for you to ponder uh, as we, uh, as we uh, go through this particular presentation, a little discussion there between Richard Dawkins and Philip Hammond, the Foreign Secretary, that was quoted in Prospect uh, in February. Uh, why was that relevant? Well, I gather there was an exercise in direct democracy at some point last year. We may get around to talking about that if I stop waffling. So, democracy. We know that there are two different types of um, democracy. We have representative and we have direct. Now, both of those recognize the primacy or rather the sovereignty of the people. So this is where all uh, political authority comes from. And uh, what we have is we have the people and we have a decision. Now, in one system, that is your, in your representative system, there is an intermediary there. We have the, uh, we have the government, uh, Parliament of Westminster in particular. So there is an intermediary uh, between the people and the decision. Over here, there is no intermediary. And so that is why we say that direct democracy is the direct and unmediated uh, involvement of the political sovereigns in policy making. So direct uh, democracy then is uh, direct, unmediated and continuous participation of citizens, blah, 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 blah. And that is actually cut and pasted from the Marx scheme. So I strongly suggest uh, that you learn it. Uh, we contrast that with representative democracy. Uh, historical, we're looking at two particular models. We've got the Athenian democracy, that is your city-state, ongoing mechanisms of involvement. The closest Real-world example we've got to that is possibly Switzerland, where they have regular referendums on significant matters of policy. The more contemporary model is occasional or sporadic involvement, and here we're looking at referendums and e-democracy, particularly uh, referendums, but e-democracy seems to be getting bigger. There's also the peculiar thing called the consultative democracy, which you may remember from pressure groups, which is when the government, before it makes a decision, will invite in various parties, various stakeholders, to consult uh, on that particular decision, cigarettes, alcohol pricing, two very, very good examples there. Anyway, direct democracy in action, e-petitions. Uh, there's a handout, uh, and I will link off to this uh, in, the, uh, in, in the notes, uh, but that will take you to here uh, for future reference. Uh, we're getting there. There we go. So e-petitions. Um, that's that. And uh, other electronic direct democracy, perhaps we can talk about those in class, and uh, consultative democracy, as I just said, uh, those are what we're talking about. Now, we do have a mechanism of recall, but it is rubbish. Uh, again, if you follow the link, uh, you will get all of the information that you need, and I will link off to this at the bottom of the uh, Facebook, uh, sorry, the, bo the bottom of the uh, file. Uh, so there you go. So, direct democracy in action. You need to know all about those. But of course, the principal one that we need to know about are referendums. And by the way, we go for referendums rather than referenda because we're not pedants and inaccurate. Anyway, these are the technical details uh, attached to a referendum. The government decides if there's going to be a referendum, that's policy sovereignty. The parliament then passes the law describing the referendum. There we have legal sovereignty. The people make the decision. So here we have the political sovereigns exercising policy sovereignty. There, that then goes back to the government. The government decides how that is going to be implemented and then Parliament passes the law. So there's many different stages in this referendum. It's not simply asking the people a question. And you can see how policy sovereignty moves around here and then goes back to government and how legal sovereignty should not be overlooked. And of course, that is directly relevant in the uh, 2017 and 2016 uh, Brexit referendum. Oh, there you go, I've broken cover, of course I know what it was. Um, so, UK referendums, they are described by legislation, uh, specifically PEPERA, the Political Parties Elections Referendum Act 2000. The Electoral Commission runs them, the governments are established by Act of Parliament, as we said, that's legal sovereignty. Uh, the Electoral Commission is um, consulted on the actual wording. Uh, and uh, before the Blair administration, we hadn't really seen much of those. Now, this one's quite interesting. Just before we go on to the next slide, the Act of Parliament, the Act that describes the legislation, the Act that creates the legislation, also says who is going to vote in it. And of course, that is relevant if you remember the Scottish independence referendum of 2014, I think it was, uh, because in that, 
the uh, 16-year-olds were allowed to vote, uh, whereas 16-year-olds were not allowed to vote in Brexit, which I think, uh, with hindsight, was a monumental error, by which I mean not the referendum, which was a monumental error anyway, but certainly not allowing 16-year-olds to vote uh, turned out to be a real uh, cock-up. Sorry, it's, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. Uh, right, so that's the UK and referendums. Here we go. So the first one you maybe need to know about is 75, when we asked Brexit um, in the first time. 79, we had Scottish. Da, 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 da. Now, one of the interesting things from all of this, well, there are a number of interesting things that follow from this. First of all, the idea that a referendum gives closure, I think, uh, is kind of uh, destroyed uh, by these particular uh instances. So Scotland was asked about a parliament in 79, and the whole of the UK was asked about Brexit in 75. Um, in both of those questions, in both of, both of those decisions were reversed by future referendums. Um, the other one I want to draw your attention to is this one. And this one is really, really interesting, because um, rather like a lawyer, or in many instances, my wife, uh, a question is never asked, a referendum is never asked unless there is already an answer in mind and unless the government is absolutely certain of getting the answer it wants. This one here in uh, 2004 is, uh, or <laughs> I was going to say it's the go-to example for a government getting a result it didn't want, uh, but then uh, I guess once again I am forgetting about this one. There is no doubt whatsoever that this was not the result that the government wanted, or certainly not the result that Cameron wanted. Um, and we can see the numbers there, and they are all incredibly significant. And just remember those particular numbers in particular, because that gets very, very interesting uh, later. So, arguments for a referendum, that it's a pure form of democracy, uh, that it provides consent for government action. Again, all of this it was, it was all kind of abstract and waffled before June 23. Uh, since then, it's become an awful lot more uh, distinct. Uh, they do encourage political participation. They encourage political awareness and theory. Uh, they can be used to overcome obstacles. Northern Ireland is a great example of that. Uh, there was by no means consensus behind the Northern Ireland peace process, but the referendum in uh, 1998 uh, essentially brought a degree of closure uh, to that. Uh, speaking of closure, here we are. We are all now happy Brexiters. Hurrah! Yes, no one's, no one's bemoaning, no one's suffering re regret. Uh, yeah, great. Can supply closure. Mm. Uh, this again, when I did this presentation last, or the last time I looked at it, this was all pre-referendum. Oh, sweet naivety. Uh, anyway, um, inconsistent on the other hand. It's inconsistent with representative democracy. It's rarely used on issues where the outcome is uncertain. Oh, God, we really did that, didn't we? Uh, it's all about government power. Now, this is very, very interesting. Uh, this was Mrs. Thatcher, uh, and she said that uh, referendums were the uh, device, were a device of dictators and demagogues. Um, and I think... By crikey, she was right. Uh, but um, <laughs> on this occasion, the government got the result it didn't want. Nevertheless, in spite of that, it's worth mentioning that uh, when it comes to a referendum, the, uh, the, the, the whole of the power is in the hands of the government. And again, with Brexit, I think we can look at the mistakes that the government made. Uh, but we'll worry about that perhaps another time. The timing is at the discretion of uh, Parliament slash the government. The wording is at the discretion of Parliament and government. I was in Australia in 99 when they asked this question. Um, basically, they were offered an impossible choice. Should we stay with the Queen or basically replace her uh, with this bloke I met down the pub? Uh, so it was an impossible question to answer, very much like the uh, 2011 uh, electoral reform question. That was loaded as well. Do you want to take out a system that's broken and awful and replace it with something worse? The Lib Dems really screwed up on that one. They did not, they, they got the referendum as it was promised, but the referendum did not ask the question uh, that they expected. Oh gosh, some issues are too complicated. I can't think of a single uh, bit of evidence that would substantiate that. Maybe one will come to me eventually. Oh, too many of the majority. Again, I can't think of a single uh, example that really demonstrates that clearly. Um, I'll have to go back and see if I can remember exactly what uh, evidence we might use to give 
uh, power to that. Um, turnout consistently low. Obviously, in Brexit, it wasn't. It was 73%, I think it was. Uh, you can go back and check. But those are your standard arguments against uh, referendums. And um, I think now they look all the more compelling uh, than ever. Um, so do the advantages of a referendum outweigh the democracy? Well, yes, they're a pure form of democracy. Uh, however, it undermines representative democracy, are indeed the masses' asses. Uh, it can legitimize action or indeed inaction. So uh, it legitimized devolution. It, it, uh, uh, it legitimized a lack of action on electoral reform. And, uh, oh God. Uh, anyway, um, so it's almost always a loaded question. And again, the EU Brexit debate, very, very good example of the government getting the answer it didn't expect. What a monumental cock up, David. Oh, I can't believe you did that. Sorry about the swearing. Uh, it offers closure. Oh, God. It, Felt like it did, but I'm not so sure it does. Uh, anyway, there we go. Just kicks the problem down the road. And as I said, there we had a uh, we had a referendum on Scotland uh, in '75. Then we had another one uh, in '98, and then we have an independence referendum in 2014. And are we going to have another one? Are we going to have another EU one? It's a flipping mess. I think is the short answer. E petitions. This you need to know about the latest form of direct democracy. Everyone's getting very excited about. Uh, again, you can read. Uh, all of that. The main point, of course, is that any debate arising from a, well, the first point, sorry, is that very, very few uh, e-petitions ever find themselves being debated in Parliament. And uh, the outcome of that debate is never anything other than consultative. They are Westminster Hall debates. They do not have any action that binds Parliament or indeed government. Uh, it is just a, um, a general uh, policy debate. Um, and that's it. Uh, really? No, I don't want to uh, keep that. I just want to go and uh, cry over Brexit. So uh, if you do have any questions, uh, then...